Hello everyone and welcome to the next edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolf and I will be today's host. It's uh, my pleasure today to, to have a presenter from uh, Piki Technologies, Walter Rochia, and he will tell us about some exciting new methods that they have been developed. Be before we start with the main uh, presentation, I would like to tell you that this webinar is being recorded and we will post a recording of this presentation on the BioXL YouTube channel and you will have an access also to copies of the slides um, uh, tomorrow or in a couple of days. Before we start, for those of you who uh, are not very familiar with BioXL, I would like to give a very short overview of the activities in our, in our center. BioXL is a European Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research and we were established two and a half years ago. In the center we work on the development of several key applications that are widely used for biomolecular simulations such as Chromax, for integrative modeling and docking HADOC and for hybrid QMMM methods such as CPMD. We also work on the development of efficient uh, workflows that uh, help with automation of common tasks that you might find very useful yourself. We work with uh, very popular platforms such as Galaxy, Climb, Taverna, OpenFacts, etc. We also provide extensive training and consultancy services, which you can find about more on our website. Something that might be uh, useful for you is we we are focused we have focused our uh, work in uh, several different interest groups that uh, you might find uh, appropriate for your type of area of research such as integrative modeling for those of you who are more interested in docking or free energy calculations for drug design etc uh, we have uh, interest group on workflows applications for industry and you can find more about those on our website and feel free to visit our uh, forums and uh, we have an open chat channel if you have any questions. At the end of today's presentation, we will have a questions and answers session where you can ask any questions to Walter during his presentation. For that, please use the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel on the right hand side. So during the about the stock, feel free to write any question that you have. And at the end, I will give you the microphone. I will let you speak directly with uh, Walter and ask your question. If we have any problems with the audio, I will read the question on your behalf. And it's my pleasure to present you uh, our speaker today. Walter Rohe is a uh, uh, is a uh, graduated uh, in electronic engineering in '96, and he uh, received his PhD in electronic devices at the University of Trento. Uh, since 2003, he's uh, joined the Molecular Biophysics Group in the National Enterprise for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology at Scuola Normale Superiore at Pisa. In 2008, he moved to the Drug Discovery and Development Department at the Italian Institute of Technology, where he is uh, working until today. He is one of the founders of the Computational Modeling for Nano, Nanoscale and Biophysical Systems Concept Lab. And he is also co-founder of Biki Technologies, which is a spin-off company of the Italian Institute of Technology. And Big Technology is providing biotech and pharma companies with high-tech cutting-edge solutions, mainly based on molecular dynamics and other advanced computational tools. And it will be of great interest, I believe, for you to learn more about the tools uh, and the methods that have been developed by uh, Big Technologies. So now I will change the presentation to Walter. Hi, Walter. Hi. Okay. Yes. 
Now it's good, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody that is attending the seminar and your Austin for the kind introduction. I will um, tell you about uh, some approaches uh, we have been uh, developed in uh, in my in my group uh, at IIT. Um, most of them are uh, are uh, aimed at uh, a most uh, proficient use of uh, molecular dynamics for uh, uh, drug discovery applications and and the underlying philosophy which uh, uh, has been uh, um, developed uh, based also on our interaction with uh, uh, computational chemistry groups in uh, in the pharma and biotech industry is to try to find uh, uh, quick but not too dirty solutions in, uh, enabling people to find interesting information even without the um, uh, claim of uh, being extremely accurate, but within times which are compatible with a drug discovery uh, pipeline. So I, I will basically uh, mention three approaches. Uh, one is um, the usage of scale MD uh, as a, a simple approach for uh, residence time prioritization of uh, uh, congeneric ligands. Uh, the second one is the Impocketron, is a tool for uh, uh, the analysis of pockets uh, uh, along the molecular dynamics trajectories. And the third one is MD binding, which is a method uh, to accelerate uh, the uh, protein ligand binding process uh, in a kind of a dynamical docking uh, fashion. So the, it, it has been uh, recently uh, described that uh, while uh, binding affinity is uh, um, very, has been always thought to be ex the, the most important feature to, um, to describe and to use a ligand, uh, a, a compound which is a, a candidate uh, uh, drug. Um, in some cases, uh, due to some uh, uh, fail of, of uh, uh, high affinity in vitro binders to the design target, um, it has been uh, conjectured that uh, other factors might have been uh, uh, extremely relevant also. And uh, there are uh, several works, uh, uh, mainly of uh, Robert Copeland and David Sweeney, where they um, state that uh, actually uh, residence time uh, can be a more informative and more predictive uh, uh, quantity rather than uh, uh, binding affinity. Um, this is uh, this might be due to the fact that uh, uh, in some cases uh, the binding occur in situations which are uh, far from equilibrio, either because for example, there are clearance phenomena uh, in the near vicinity of the target uh, or because of other situations that bring the, the, the systems out of uh, equilibrium uh, in such a way that if you have two, um, let's, let's imagine to have two different molecules with similar uh, affinity, but one with a faster rate of binding and unbinding, association and dissociation, and while the other has a slower um, association and dissociation times, the second one should be preferred because once it enters, it stays for longer time, so it doesn't, uh, res uh, there are no repercussions uh, from uh, uh, potential uh, phenomena occurring uh, in the, uh, outside the binding site, let's say. So practical experimental um, in determination of KOF uh, is, uh, it can be expensive and time consuming, not just because you have to synthesize the molecules and you have to functionalize your target uh, and you have several possible um, experimental means to, um, to try to estimate the, um, the association, the association time of your uh, molecules, uh, but also the experimental determination can be, can have some drawbacks. In any case, it, it's costly. So it would be really useful if we could have a, um, a way, a computational way uh, to uh, provide this uh, estimate. Um, and molecular dynamics uh, can be uh, useful in this respect. Um, 
uh, at least in principle. Um, uh, in the in molecular in classical molecular dynamics, uh, uh, the level theory used to describe the system is uh, the molecular mechanics level, uh, and the problem with this kind of description is that if you are considering a, a real good candidate for uh, um, uh, as a drug, uh, its residence time can be on the order, uh, also on the order of seconds, minutes, even hours in some cases. So there is no uh, hope to uh, describe this phenomenon uh, um, with a brute force uh, molecular dynamics. Um, then uh, several uh, methods have been uh, um, uh, have been devised in order to accelerate this this phenomenon, which is a, a rare event per se. Um, among them, I'd like to mention Markov state modeling, free energy based methods, transitional pulse sampling, my stoning, metadynamic, and so on. We suggest a, a much uh, simpler minded approach uh, based on uh, um, the scale MD uh, tool. I will uh, approach you. I will describe you in a while. <clears throat> so, uh, concerning, for example, methods which would like to derive uh, the dissociation rate um, from uh, uh, the free energy profile, uh, several uh, problems uh, arise due to the fact that in order to identify um, your free energy profile, which is needed in order to estimate the barrier, uh, you need to identify which could be uh, a reasonable um, reaction coordinate for your uh, for your binding and this uh, might be not obvious especially if your target is not uh, extremely well known uh, um, then uh, in in some of the <coughs> uh, on the modelistic assumptions that are done in this case uh, only ideal first order reactions are considered while in reality the profile can be much less ideal uh, and then uh, one thing that uh, it would be important to to stress is that uh, a very uh, minor uh, error on the estimation of the free energy can result uh, in a, a much larger error on the on the estimate of the uh, of the kinetic constant. So what we uh, um, suggest is uh, very, very, as I was telling you, in, in this uh, search for uh, quick but hopefully not too dirty solutions, um, um, is uh, based on the uh, smoothing of the potential induced by the scale molecular dynamics approach. Uh, in the scale molecular dynamics, you basically put a scaling factor in front of your uh, of the potential energy of your system and in this case you reduce linearly all the uh, barriers in the potential energy landscape not directly in, in, in the free energy unfortunately but uh, uh, at least uh, you definitely you you reduce the barrier even in the, if in the case of free energy this is not a linear uh, correspondence um, so uh, if we can assume that uh, the binding in case of a good molecule of a good candidate drug is corresponds in, in free energy in, in a very deep well, uh, we can pay the price of uh, losing detailed information on the, on, on, on the uh, details of the interaction that a, a molecule is having with the binding partner. Um, provide that we have an estimate of the depth of this of this well, uh, and in order to do this, uh, if we scale the uh, the interaction of, of uh, in your system, all the interaction on your system, you will expect uh, that uh, your uh, ligand eventually will uh, come out of the of the system because you are also decreasing the interaction between the ligand and the binding site. Of course. Um, you might um, might say that uh, this is the, the biggest assumption in this case is probably that uh, uh, the interaction between the ligand and the protein is the weakest uh, uh, chain, the weakest ring in the chain, so the one which breaks uh, first, which may not be the case. So it might be that it, since you are uh, decreasing 
the potential energy for all the interactions in, within your system uh, some other thing uh, will some, some other bond will break some that for example secondary structure in some point may may get lost and even unfolding may occur so uh, in order to avoid for this uh, for this uh, phenomena to occur we put uh, a slight constraint on the on all the backbone uh, heavy atoms of the protein except for those which are in the vicinity of the binding site so basically we, we want to uh, strengthen the the structural aspects which we think are not are not involved in, in the unbinding uh, phenomenon uh, and we uh, why we would like to <coughs> to to uh, avoid any kind of bias in the um, in the interaction between the ligand and the binding site uh, so the, the i mean of course this is a, this is a, a limitation of the approach but the nice thing of it is that uh, we don't need to have any kind of idea or assumption concerning the re uh, reaction coordinate so we we let everything which is related uh, to the interaction uh, in the near vicinity of the uh, ligand and the binding site free and and then we expect that the ligand which which is uh, linked to the binding site in the weakest way will come up first uh, so the parameters in the, of this approach are uh, the scaling factor and where to put the restraints is a sim very simple and intuitive uh, approach um, and one can decide <coughs> of course the, the stronger i mean the the um, the stronger is the scaling in the sense that the smaller is the parameter you put the number you put in front of your um, potential energy the the faster you expect uh, to to observe unbinding but also the more the the largest uh, loss of uh, detail you will have is like uh, zooming out uh, from your your system so you find you need to find uh, um, a, a trade-off between uh, this thing and you decide this trade-off based on the uh, accuracy you wanted to achieve and the computational resources you 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 have in order to to have this kind of um, figure of merit uh, we we perform several replicas uh, and replicas of this where all of them starting from the uh, bound uh, pose and then we um, take a, a, an indication of uh, when the ligand is out or interrupted or the interaction with the, <coughs> with the binding site uh, and then we average this time along the uh, these replicas and the nice thing of it is that these replicas are uh, completely independent so the approach is uh, uh, trivially parallel um, the connection between the uh, simulated uh, unbinding time and the real unbinding time uh, is uh, mm, is uh, shown in this slide uh, where you can see that actually your uh, um, scaling parameters act on the enthalpic part of, of the of the energy um, but since we usually in, in drug discovery uh, consider for this kind of comparisons um, congeneric uh, ligands we may expect that uh, the difference in the unbinding uh, entropy isn't shouldn't be uh, large so it, it, sorry not large uh, different in, in from one ligand to another uh, so when you consider uh, uh, the ratio of the unbinding times both in the simulated case and in the real case you should expect to be able to neglect this the entropic part in this uh, uh, in this case and so to have a, a quite simple relationship between the uh, ratio uh, of the simulated and binding times with respect to the real binding times uh, we do this uh, uh, in so our first aim was to uh, guess the right ranking but by ranking i mean i would like to identify first the ligand which has the longest residence time and then uh, ordering with respect to residence sign in many cases uh, it's actually important just to separate the long-lived interaction from the 
uh, from the other ones. So e even uh, the exact ranking is not uh, necessary in many, uh, in many cases. Uh, so let's see how it works. So as I told you, this is a very simple-minded approach. So we wanted to see whether, but also pretty easy to, to implement. Um, so we wanted to see whether it was working or not. At that time, we uh, which was uh, roughly four years ago, um, we took the um, residence time data that were available in the literature. And, and so we took uh, um, some cases for the adenosinic receptor uh, um, binding to um, triazine from the series developed in the Eptares uh, uh, company, the HSP90 um, other ligands for the HSP90 target, uh, uh, a few ligands also for the GRP78, which is uh, involved in uh, autoimmune neurodegenerative and metabolic disease. And finally, we started uh, through the, uh, the company a collaboration with some uh, pharma companies, which had real case uh, where they have a lot of uh, um, experimental data. They wanted to, to, to challenge our uh, our approach and uh, with the uh, one of them was with the Servier uh, company which is based in uh, Paris and they <coughs> tested <coughs> the validated the approach with the glucokinase uh, target um, and you will see the result in, in a while then uh, within another collaboration uh, we are also uh, testing the approach uh, with fragments in top of uh, uh, on top of ligands so these are the results. Uh, generally speaking, the, the results are pretty good in the sense that, that we are always able to, um, to separate um, the, the slow uh, binder from the uh, fast unbinders. Um, and in even more, uh, if we take uh, uh, one of them as a reference, uh, we make a, a regressive model based on the Arrhenius uh, uh, formula I showed you before, Arrhenius-like formula I showed you before, we also get a pretty good uh, uh, regressive model that could be used to uh, predict the, um, re the residence time or at least the positioning of, uh, within this graph of uh, new uh, congeneric compounds. So this is the case of the pyrazole inhibitors of HSP90, and this is the case of uh, purine analogs of uh, uh, binding to GRP78. And this is the case of the uh, triazine binding to the uh, adenosine uh, receptor. <coughs> the results are mentioned in this uh, scientific reports paper. This was the work done in collaboration uh, with the um, uh, Servier Pharma Company. Uh, and has been published in uh, JMED CAN uh, again in 2016. Uh, as you can see, the, in some cases the, uh, the correlation is uh, better. In this last case, um, there was, a, a, I would say, a larger challenge because uh, the, the, the ligands had different scaffolds. So uh, we are less uh, consistent with the assumption that uh, the, um, the ligands are really congeneric. But still the results are uh, uh, pretty interesting. And this is the, the paper. Okay, so in summary, for the first approach I, I wanted to, to show you, uh, we can <coughs> say that um, uh, scale MD simulation seems to be able to provide uh, a relative estimate of, an estimate of relative residence times. <coughs> This data can be obtained uh, in a reasonable amount of time with reasonable uh, computational uh, resources uh, in a way that can be compatible with the hit to lead and lead optimization um, drug discovery uh, phases. Um, so in, uh, in many cases that we have experience of, uh, the correct ranking uh, was, uh, was recovered. In some cases, also a regressive model was uh, predictive for uh, uh, the new new uh, compounds. Uh, I would like to stress that, <clears throat> so what we are uh, uh, actually uh, simulating here is the um, residence time, the strength, if you want, of the interaction uh, of the initial uh, binding pose. That means that uh, we need uh, to start from a good uh, 
uh, a good uh, approximation of the uh, actual binding pose of the uh, between the the target and the considered ligand otherwise uh, you might get uh, a faster uh, exit time due to the fact that the ligand was not put in the right position and was not making the right interactions with the target okay now let's switch to the second uh, the second approach which is pocket run uh, we started from the need to have a way to analyze in uh, almost uh, automated fashion long uh, um, uh, trajectories from molecular dynamics. And we wanted to have uh, an idea of what was occurring on the surface of the protein without uh, having in mind a specific site but having something that was uh, describing the dynamics at the surface entirely on the entire surface of, of a protein there are there are uh, uh, of course uh, very many different approaches uh, uh, to identify statically um, pockets uh, on the on the surface of, a, of the protein I, the, the list here is uh, is just uh, an example i have no claim to to have a complete uh, review here of that uh, some of them uh, uh, are based on uh, Voronoi diagrams, some of them uh, use grids, uh, some of them are also based on the molecular surface and probes. Um, other approaches also consider structure ensembles and MD trajectories. And in, in some cases, they have uh, they need uh, a preliminary structure uh, for, uh, uh, for alignment. In other cases, they uh, identify pockets based on the atoms which uh, form the pocket itself and and th then uh, they can make uh, several kind of uh, analysis uh, either of the shape uh, or uh, uh, physical chemical parameters uh, evolutionary parameters uh, they, th there are all of the of different plenty of different uh, analysis that can be done in order to identify for example whether a pocket is draggable or uh, or not so in our case, we, uh, we had some requirements in mind. Uh, so we wanted to have a, a, an analysis which was intrinsically dynamical. So taking uh, into account the chain of event occurring during the molecular dynamic trajectory um, without uh, needing to focus on uh, uh, one specific pocket, but uh, uh, having a, a description of the wall surface we wanted to have a, a fast and possibly parallelizable approach and in the end we would like to have some uh, way some graphical way to uh, to have a, a synthetic uh, interpretation of, of, the, of the results so the solution that we decide to apply for those requirements was uh, to to have a, a pocket definition based on the molecular surface concept i will tell you in a while why we did this uh, we didn't want to, to, to need to rely on a preliminary uh, alignment, but uh, uh, we wanted to have a, a, an atom-based identification of the pocket. We need, of course, to be able to connect the, the configuration, what we observed in terms of pocket at one uh, time with what we observe in uh, another time so we need to to do pocket matching between different frames of the trajectory we decide to use the nano shaper tool uh, that we developed a few years ago because uh, it is uh, uh, parallelizable and is a very robust uh, builder for molecular surface in the end uh, we, we decide to provide uh, uh, some useful graphical representation of volume uh, and surface area long time. So this is the uh, definition of the molecular surface. You should imagine uh, at, at least the, the one according to the <coughs> Lee and Richard definition. Uh, you make a probe, your solvent probe rolling over your, uh, your uh, Van der Waal uh, system, and then you fill up all the spaces where the probe cannot enter. And then you have a, a surface. So the nano shaper was born uh, in uh, in order to be coupled with some Poisson Boltzmann solver, like we did for the Delphi Poisson Boltzmann solver, in order to uh, be able to calculate the 
the molecular surface. Um, at the same time, it identifies cavities. I will also pockets. I will tell you in a while how it does. <clears throat> and it calculates volume, surface area, and the atoms that that face into the into the cavity itself. And the way it does, and, and the, the the reason why it is quite robust is that it put the system into onto a grid and they cast rays uh, along the grid lines and and it has uh, an analytical description of the patches uh, that compose the surface and so it, it calculates with a very high accuracy the intersection between these rays and the patches and so it calculated the uh, positions where the surface is uh, located and then you can triangulate uh, and do all the functionality perform the functionalities that I described to you so nanoshaper is uh, uh, freely downloadable uh, from the uh, our website um, so now we for the time being we have uh, a tool um, that builds the uh, molecular surface but then Ah, well, just uh, to add that uh, Nanoshaper um, has been recently incorporated in, uh, recently integrated with the VMD uh, tool uh, as a further option to build uh, molecular surfaces. Okay, this is just an example of the computational performance uh, in terms of uh, surface building and cavity uh, calculations on a pretty large uh, system. Uh, the nanoshaper tool is described in the plus one uh, paper uh, and then let's go to the pocket so if you now have a tool which is very uh, practical and and uh, reliable to to build uh, the molecular surface you can imagine uh, calc uh, applying this twice by changing the probe radius once you you have the um, small probe radius so your uh, uh, surface will be uh, will have more uh, invaginations and then you calculate the, the the molecular surface with a larger probe radius uh, so that uh, you you have a, a smoother version of the surface and then you make the volumetric difference between the volume enclosed uh, within these two uh, surfaces and what you get in the uh, at the end is uh, the one which is uh, described here in black, um, which is uh, uh, a, a, sur a surface pocket, basically. Um, then, okay, so this was the first part, static identification of pockets. Then, uh, as I told you, you need, um, you need a way to connect uh, pockets that you observed at, at a given time with pockets that you observe at, at a further time in uh, in a molecular dynamics uh, simulation we do this with the uh, jacquard index uh, so we observe uh, the atoms that were composing all the pockets at the previous time then uh, we observe the atoms that, that are composing pockets uh, at the current time and then uh, if uh, and then we look for uh, pockets we share the maximum amount of atoms and the these are the same pocket uh, just evolved uh, a long time. Uh, in case there was no match before, uh, it means that a new pocket uh, uh, was created. In case uh, some atoms uh, are no longer exposed to the, to the solvent, it means that uh, the pocket uh, closed. And so we uh, perform all these kind of uh, collection, data collections, uh, and then we uh, observe that uh, there are uh, quite often, I would say very often, uh, phenomena uh, that we define as merge and split in the sense that you can have two nearby pockets uh, that uh, at some point uh, uh, separate in the sense that some of the atoms go in one other pocket, some of the atoms uh, stay in the original one, and uh, similarly they uh, merge together uh, in, a, in, a larger, uh, in a larger one. Uh, and so we collect also <clears throat> these events of merge and split. This is an example of um, the analysis that we can perform. So uh, say you have a pocket which are in indicated in, uh, in blue here. This is the PMP uh, enzyme, trimeric enzyme case. Um, 
you can identify the largest pockets uh, and all the more persistent along time. You can monitor the volume along, along the, the simulation. And you can, as I, as I was telling you, you can uh, um, collect the uh, number of merge and, and split event. Um, you can also ask yourself whether this merge and split have uh, a physical meaning or some consequence. Um, so by doing this, uh, we represent this data into uh, graphs uh, that uh, somehow uh, tell us uh, which amount of crosstalking is present uh, between these pockets. By crosstalking, I mean exactly the fact that these pockets uh, share some atoms. Sometimes they are in one, sometimes the same atom belong to another pocket. Um, and this is actually the, the basis uh, for uh, the Pocketron approach. Uh, so as you can see um, here, the, in, in the right, we applied this uh, representation and this analysis to the Abelson kinase system for which there is a lot of knowledge available. Uh, so the um, uh, pockets, the, so we, we, re we are representing here only uh, the pockets which have uh, a larger volume and a persistence, a quite significant persistence along the molecular dynamic simulations. Um, the, we represent pockets with the ball. Uh, the size of, of the ball uh, is proportional somehow to the volume of the pocket. The color is, uh, uh, is coding for the persistency and the, the edges between the pockets, uh, some, the, the width of, of the edges is uh, um, related to the amount of crosstalk between them. So in this case, we are, we're actually um, quite um, surprised of finding out a correlation um, between uh, the crosstalk network that we identified with our approach and uh, uh, the allosteric connection between uh, uh, pockets in, uh, in, uh, in this system. So in the left two um, systems we are, we are observing, we have uh, um, the non-mutated isoform of the, uh, of the protein. Uh, up is uh, without the allosteric binder, and uh, down is uh, with the miristate uh, allosteric binder. Um, the, the pocket correspond, I don't know if you can see the, the cursor. Uh, so the, the pocket where the uh, MIRI state is supposed to bind is uh, this one, the uh, down uh, left part. In the right uh, uh, column, you can observe the mutated isoform where uh, it, mutated, it is mutated in the uh, 315 position, uh, again without and with the MIRI state. So what we were able to, to observe is that uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the case of uh, mutated protein uh, without the MIRI state bound, the crosstalk network uh, in our coming from our analysis was interrupted while uh, in the case where the uh, when the bound uh, when the MIRI state was bound the crosstalk was was a uh, network was active uh, the two pockets were connected um, so this was a nice indication that uh, uh, possibly there is some uh, fingerprint of uh, uh, allosteric connection passing also over the uh, protein surface. And this is the better described in the ACS Central Science paper that you can see on the, on the left. Um, we also tested the, 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 what, what was going on by uh, estimating the um, binding affinity of uh, the dazatinib uh, inhibitor uh, in the orthosteric site in the presence and the absence of the MIRI state uh, uh, binder. So in the end, the pocket and approach seems to be able to provide uh, an efficient description of the main geometric feature uh, of the pockets uh, emerging in a molecular dynamic trajectory. 
um, this analysis uh, show, tell us that there is a highly dynamical environment uh, and we observe, were able to observe a lot of uh, merge and split events and we try to see whether this event can have some uh, uh, meaning uh, and we uh, try to correlate this uh, the, um, the crosstalk network to uh, allosteric uh, um, link on uh, uh, the Abelson kinase system and we are performing now the same analysis on different <coughs> systems to see whether this feature is uh, is also observed in other systems. In any case the, this tool is uh, able to perform a, an automated analysis and description of the pockets uh, along a molecular dynamic simulation and can be co uh, complementary to other computational protocols which aim at targeting some uh, some binding site some, or potential binding site and this is the last uh, um, the last uh, uh, application that I would like to the last approach the method that I would like to to show you is the um, MD binding um, so the ND binding uh, uh, stemmed from the desire to, the need to, to accelerate the binding uh, between uh, uh, ligand and the protein target. Uh, you can do this via, of course, via brute force MD. It, it worked sometimes uh, by means of a very, very, very impressive uh, <coughs> uh, computational effort, uh, such as the, the one uh, done by the DE show research group uh, thanks to the supercomputer Anton or you can do for example with uh, GPUs uh, um, and other uh, uh, architectural computer architectural uh, instruments um, in any case still if you have uh, a if you, if you are considering a general uh, case, uh, the time for binding is still uh, pretty uh, demanding as a computational uh, phenomenon, uh, a phenomenon to be studied by computational means, and it, especially, especially if you need to have some kind of statistics out of it, which is necessary in order to get. Uh, um, thermodynamic observable estimate. So we want, to, so therefore, <coughs> uh, enhanced sampling techniques uh, have been devised in order to um, uh, to get statistics uh, from uh, um, molecular dynamics uh, simulations. Uh, but those tools <coughs> uh, need. Uh, uh, some uh, collective variable which is supposed to be a good approximation of the reaction coordinates. This is not obvious. If you have uh, a wrong or too degenerate collective variable like the simple distance between the ligand and the binding site, uh, you are not accelerating the concerted binding process. And if you are pushing with your uh, computational enhanced sampling method uh, too much your system in order to observe uh, the phenomenon you want to observe, uh, you end up uh, uh, having unphysical uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, so we wanted to see whether we could do something different uh, and we exploited uh, the one force which is uh, one natural force which is one of the way how nature uh, actually um, uh, accelerates the association events and this is electrostatics. But our electrostatic is not linked to the real electrostatic of the system. We are just adding a bias um, uh, between the ligand and the binding site. Um, so you, you, you need to know where your ligand is, which are the atoms composing your binding site, and to have some idea, basically, most geometrical uh, concerning the, the binding site, uh, and we, we use for this uh, nano shaper, um, and then you start your simulation <coughs> attracting the, the ligand. The, uh, the shape of the bias is this one, is uh, uh, very similar to the traditional electrostatic energy of a system. Uh, we used the coefficient uh, in front of it to make the protocol adaptive. By adaptive, I mean that um, it rescales the strength of the attraction by feeling the total force that the ligand is feeling, the, the regular force, not the bias one. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, and also uh, it, it's adaptive in the sense that when uh, it feels that the transition state um, is passed, the, the, the bias is automatically switched, uh, switched off. So this is an example of how it works. In, in, uh, we did this uh, for the SAR kinase uh, interacting with the PP1 inhibitor, for which there is also the counterpart from uh, the DSHO research, the brute force counterpart. In the right panels, uh, in the upper one, you observe the <coughs> RMSD with respect to the crystal, and in the lower panel, you observe the strength of the bias, which is not the, whose inter, um, shape is not based on the, on the RMSD. So we have we, we can plot the upper panel just because we know the actual final um, the, the the right crystallographic pose, but the um, the the bias strength is actually based on um, the position of the ligand, but there is no information on the on the crystal. So we we start this uh, bias molecular dynamics. Then so we do this. Uh, 20 times per pocket entrance. Every uh, replica is uh, 20 nanoseconds long. So again, also this is uh, a trivially parallel approach. Uh, you have several trajectories, um, and you, among them, you prune out all, all of those for which the uh, bias didn't um, switch off. And uh, among them, so you, you already do a, a uh, down selection in this way <clears throat> and among among them um, for which we observe that in roughly five percent of the replicas you get uh, a final pose with an RMSD below to Armstrong uh, uh, so among the uh, among the the part of the trajectories for which the uh, the bias switched off, uh, we do clustering and we take the representative of that clustering and we use ScaleMD. Again, uh, in a similar way as we, we, we was doing in the first approach I was showing you, but uh, just one replica uh, with a five nanosecond ScaleMD in order to test to uh, yeah to test the system and, and to, to see which pose was uh, more stable than the others and this uh, pro uh, provided a performance which was either equal or better than uh, all the other uh, scoring functions that uh, that we uh, that we could uh, observe so this is uh, the basically uh, what we saw uh, let me so okay this let me, okay, so th this is the ranking obtained via the ScaleMD uh, approach. And these were the system we tested uh, our approach with. Uh, acetylcholinesterase with donepezil and galantamine, several kinases, a few GPCRs, uh, the SAR kinase again, and DAP, and also a protein peptide system, this, which was RAD51 uh, BRCA2. As you can see, the, the, the best RM, RMSD obtained uh, the, sorry, the RMSD of the best midoid is in column three, while the minimum observed RMSD is in column four, but uh, this is, so this is telling us that uh, during the molecular dynamics run, you have uh, conformations which are very, very close to the crystal one, but you have basically no way to figure out which they are. So these numbers are interesting, but useless in a predictive uh, approach. Why the, the third column actually is what we got from our clustering plus um, scale and molecular dynamics approach. The computational effort that you can see in the last column is uh, pretty interesting because you have uh, 20, in most of the cases, you have 20 uh, independent runs, uh, which was lasting uh, 20 nanoseconds. Uh, so it is a uh, pretty uh, fast approach, especially with respect to the brute force counterparts, which are indicated uh, in, uh, in red. So this is how you perform the, the approach. You, via NanoShaper, you identify the pockets. The user selects the, the one which is the target site. Then uh, NanoShaper locates the entrances of the binding site. In this case, they were three. It clusterizes the normal vector to the entrance. It positions the, uh, the ligand at a given distance from the uh, protein surface. Uh, and then it starts the uh, simulation. 
uh, one more thing <clears throat> on top of the final poses for the successful path we also um, we also considered potential similarities uh, with the uh, unbiased uh, brute force simulation coming from uh, the DE show research. We did this for, for the GPCR beta 12 prenal um, interaction where we could observe that uh, the orientation, the, the, regardless of the initial orientation of the of the ligand, uh, all of them uh, reoriented before entering the <clears throat> the binding site, and there was also an opening uh, of the binding site uh, enabling the entrance of the ligands. Uh, and this this occurred on a very different time scale, as you can observe by comparing the red and blue figures in the upper row. But uh, the from the dynamical point of view, uh, they were pretty pretty similar. Pretty similar. The, in the, se the, the second case where we, where we were able to compare uh, um, our results with the uh, uh, brute force simulation was the SARC and PP1 systems, where we observed that despite uh, um, the, 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 the ligands started from different positions, uh, they all passed, for, and despite the fact that the, the pocket is, uh, has a very large entrance, uh, all of them passed through a very little. Uh, part of the entrance and then we observed afterwards that in that part is where there is a, a hydrophobic patch with that potentially is a, uh, where the ligand prefer to enter because of their uh, chemical uh, behavior. So finally uh, the MD binding approach seems to be able to accelerate the protein ligand recognition uh, and also the path seems to be uh, physical like uh, physically sound let's say so this uh, approach can be coupled with more uh, accurate uh, uh, approaches uh, that want to uh, estimate for example free energy surface um, and this can be paired with the previously presented uh, um, pocketron approach uh, which is uh, uh, a tool for uh, pocket analysis and identification so I would like to thank my collaborators uh, in uh, IIT, um, Prof. Andrea Cavalli, um, Dr. Andrea Spitari and Sanjo De Kerchi, and Dr. Mark Devivo for the Pocketron uh, approach. Uh, and the tools that I have been describing to you today are uh, uh, implemented in the Biki Life Science uh, uh, software, which is sold by uh, Biki Technology. And I would like to thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you, Walter. Yes, so this was a very interesting presentation of these tools. I'm sure they, they're really useful for everyone who is doing modeling and simulations. I will encourage everyone to post your questions in the... Uh, can, can we have the last slide, Walter, please? The, yeah, thanks. In the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. I was. Uh, I have one question. I was wondering about Scale MD. Well, what is the performance of the software? How much overhead does it include? Over so, uh, the uh, the the performance of a Scale MD simulation is exactly the same as molecular. Uh, plain molecular ah. dynamic simulation because you are just running a plain molecular dynamic simulation in a different ensemble uh, which is uh, um, with a, a, a fraction in front of the uh, potential energy from the point of view of uh, performance this is not affecting uh, uh, the performance in, in any way mm -hmm. yeah, that's, uh, that's good um, there is a question by Adam, actually. Um, Adam, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, so I was just, uh, you mentioned towards the end that the, the, the protocol can benefit from complementary tools, um, and uh, like Pocketron. Um, so uh -huh. of the various pieces of software and the various techniques that you've used, um, I wonder if you could comment on how they can be Sort of used together as part of a, a wider workflow. Do, uh, have you thought about how these um, the, these tools and things can be used with other pieces of software? Yeah, 
so it actually, uh, while personally I am more into the algorithmical development, uh, the once the uh, algorithm are implemented and make made available uh, to the users uh, via the Biki um, software, they also have been uh, uh, tested and coupled with other uh, uh, approaches. Um, like, uh, for example, in, in one case, uh, the, the cluster analysis uh, uh, concerning pockets was, uh, uh, was run over some targets, and this, the, the results were used in order to improve the virtual screening, uh, virtual screening um, protocol, which was uh, used with the, uh, with the more classical molecular, molecular docking um, tool. So in this case, it was done and the results were improved, of course, because the, um, the, the conformations of the pockets that we observed were uh, more prone to, ident to the identification of uh, good ligands. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. So we have a question by Olivier. So let's see if uh, we can hear Olivier. Olivier, can you hear us? Can you say something? Okay. Maybe we don't have good audio connection. So I'm going to read his question. Uh, Olivier is wondering whether uh, how scale scaled MD uh, implements Gromax and in what way could the parameters for the potentials could be changed? So the we, we had uh, we did a, a custom modification of the Gromax uh, software where uh, where we simply uh, added the possibility to um, to put the uh, scaling factor so the scaling factor is put in front of the um, in front of the uh, potential energy of the system. There is no other uh, force field uh, parameter which needs to be modified. So we uh, this is a, I mean apart from the fact that it, it we need it needed to uh, modif modify the Gromax software. Uh, all the rest is trivial. Mm -hmm. And this uh, patched version, is it available on your website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you uh, can uh, send me an email or uh, I can, uh, and yeah, since it was a, a modification on Gromax, which is GPL, it is also a GPL. Mm -hmm. Yes. And do you, do you have support for other MD engines? Uh, MD, Amber, uh, or at the moment, uh, uh, no. But uh, uh, people at Biki, they are uh, they are working on it. And the pro the point is that uh, I mean every software has his own uh, implementation and his own way to, uh, to you, you you need to figure out where where to put your hands in order to add external forces. Mm -hmm. But there is uh, a lot of work in progress in this direction. Yeah. And so I, I encourage everybody to, to follow up with the development on Vicky's website if uh, there are users of other backend engines. Uh, also, ScaleMD, how, how does it compare with uh, other approaches in terms of uh, quickly exploring the, uh, the surface? How efficient is it? Uh, you mean uh, uh, pocket run, the, the molecular surface, or uh, yeah. ScaleMD? Scale them the. So, uh, so, which surface you you, you mean the, the... Uh, energy surface? Yeah. Ah, yeah. No, uh, we the, the, as I was mentioning at the, uh, the beginning, this was this was meant to be a <laughs> quick, uh, hopefully not too dirty solution to the problem. So we don't have any claim that we are able to use this uh, to explore the free energy surface. So the the the, the basic thing is if the, the bound state correspond to a very deep uh, funnel. Then, by means of the, then, since w when you do scaling, you are uh, losing details, of course, on the interaction mm -hmm. because you are also scaling the details, the, their cells. Um, but the point is that it, since this uh, well is pretty deep, uh, you should be able, nevertheless, to be able to rank 
different ligands uh, by by reducing this uh, this well. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, loss of detail hinder for uh, hinder a, a more refined uh, uh, usage which was needed, which would be needed in order to estimate the free energy. So mm -hmm. we, we don't estimate free energy. I see. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we're already past the hour, so I suggest we stop here. And uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Walter. Could you please show the last slide, actually, after the, this one? Yeah. So for our audience, uh, I want to let you know that uh, we are planning on 10th of May another webinar in our series that uh, you're welcome to register and hear presentation by Andrew Proudfoot from Novartis. And uh, yes, and with this, I'd like to finish and thank Walter for the great presentation. And to all our listeners, please visit uh, Biki Technologies website uh, to find more about the different tools that they have and to follow up with the development. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.